I started my career in big law at some of the top law firms in Australia, Europe, and Asia. I've also worked in-house and for large corporates as a lawyer. But entrepreneurship has always been in my blood, in my family. And uh, I actually started my first business when I was about five years old, selling uh, old toys to kids uh, out of my cousin's garage. And uh, more recently, as an adult, I've started and sold out a number of tech startups and other businesses along the way. I've been advising startups for almost 20 years, and I've helped startups raise capital in an amount of over $300 million now. In around 2012, I was helping a friend with his startup, not in an official legal capacity, but as a, as a commercial advisor. He was working with a mid-sized law firm at the time, negotiating a commercial contract. And the lawyers had gone back and forth with the other side almost 20 times. And I said to him, look, can I have a go at this? It shouldn't be taking this long because obviously the longer you negotiate, as some of you may know, working with lawyers, the more expensive it is. Let me pick up the phone and talk to the other side which is exactly what he let me do, picked up the phone, had a couple of minute conversation with the other side and we closed the deal. And that's when I realized that for a lawyer to make an impact on startups, you have to provide big law quality advice. So the same sort of quality advice that you would get at a big law firm, but you have to provide a very close relationship with the founder to understand their day-to-day -day challenges. And that's how Metis Law was born. We're a boutique capital raising law firm and we provide top quality advice with service that is adjusted for startups. So we understand your business, we understand your goals, and we understand that you can't afford to be negotiating, you know, 20 drafts of an agreement to get a deal done. And Termsheet Guru is our product that's designed specifically for early stage startups to help them raise capital quickly and cost effectively. I've been in the trenches of capital raising as a founder myself and as an advisor. And one of the things I see often is startup founders building their board of directors and their advisory boards by accident rather than by design. And there are two problems with this. First, you're leaving value on the table. You've probably got lots of people around you that you could be using and you're not. And the second is you're increasing risk to yourself as founder and to your startup. We had a client who was a co-founder of his startup who came to see us a couple of years ago now. He was a director and so was his co-founder, but he left most of the financials and the cap raising to his co-founder. His co-founder died unexpectedly. And so suddenly he was the sole di founder director in his company and he had to take over the reins of the company. He realized that the financial position of the company was extremely dire. And without his knowledge, his co-founder had been making side agreements with other investors, issuing convertible notes and just making side deals that he wasn't aware of because he'd left all these things up to his co-founder, all the financials he left to his co-founder to, to deal with. So when his co-founder died, the convertible notes were coming up for repayment and the company didn't have enough funds to repay them. They also, the company also had outstanding BAS and superannuation payments. An investor who was going to put more money into the business was holding them to ransom as a result. Now, our client, the founder and the director was personally exposed. And the fact that he was not aware of these things having gone on would not have been an excuse. He was a director. It was his duty to understand and be on top of the financials. So if you're a director of your startup, my question to you for today is, do you know what's going on in your business? So we've got lots to talk about today uh, about boards and advisory boards. And at the end, we'll have a quiz and we'll be giving away one ticket to our term sheet negotiation masterclass in November, on the 21st of November. On the masterclass, you'll learn negotiation skills, you'll learn about capital raising and the term sheet, and you'll walk away with an investor ready term sheet for your next cap raise. So if you want to be in the running for that uh, free ticket, follow us on Facebook the Term Sheet Guru Facebook page. Tony's going to put a link into it, uh, to it on the chat. Uh, follow us there and at the end, we'll run a quiz through the Facebook page. Before I start, I'd like to get a gauge of who is in the audience today so I can tailor the talk to you. Tony's going to put up a poll with a few questions for you to answer about yourself. So a few questions. Which one best describes you? Are you a founder, a non-founder of startup? an advisor or something else or another role? <laughs> what stage of business are you at? You haven't launched yet. You've launched your startup. You've launched and you're at the startup phase with no or little revenue. You're a scale-up and you're growing. 
you're looking for an exit in the next 12 to 24 months or none of the above. Question three, are you a director of your startup? Yes or no? And question four, is your startup Australian or New Zealand incorporated? The reason why we ask that is some of the obligations are slightly different for directors in Australia and New Zealand. So I'll give you a couple of, uh, maybe a minute to answer those questions. Okay, excellent. So results. Everyone here is a founder, fantastic. 25% uh, have not launched yet. Half have launched and you're in the startup phase. And we've got 25% in the scale-up phase. Everyone here is a director of their startup. Great. And we've got both Australian and New Zealand companies here today. Okay, excellent. Thank you for that. Why is this issue important? I'll give you a scenario. So Alex and Ben, and these, these are based on real characters who have come to see us. Alex and Ben are co-founders of a startup that provides an operating system for farming seaweed. So seaweed has thousands of uses from food and beverage to fertilizer, even health and beauty products. It's a huge uh, potential and growing industry. They have a grant from a university and they had a number of very enthusiastic potential investors wanting to invest in their business. So they were doing a seed round of capital raising when they came to see us. They had two potential investors in particular who were demanding a board seat. So there was Carla from a family office and Joel, who was actually a friend of one of the founders. Now, Alex and Ben know that they need to keep their board lean and agile, but they also want to be able to get the investment. So they didn't want the issue of board seat to be a roadblock for getting funds in. And if you've done capital raising, I'm sure you've come across this situation yourself where an investor wants a board seat. So Alex and Ben came to Termsheet Guru to ask whether to give away the board seats to these two investors. At Termsheet Guru, we, we use this model in order to help companies go through capital raising quickly and successfully. So there are three modules. There's the seed stage, the sprout stage, and the growth stage. And this issue of negotiating board seats and understanding board seats falls within the growth stage of negotiating contracts. You see the purple circle there. If you'd like to learn more about the model and how we apply it, um, we go through it in a lot of detail in the masterclass. So firstly, what are the differences between a board and, a, and an advisory board. Now, today you might hear me talk about, use the term board or fiduciary board interchangeably. Um, a fiduciary duty I'll get into in a minute, but a board and fiduciary board are the same. And then on the other side, you have an advisory board. So firstly, the nature of the engagement is different. So a board seat is normally formal, in fact, it's always formal, and it's an appointment either by directors or by shareholders. Whereas an advisory director, the appointment can be formal or informal, and it's usually, the person's usually appointed by the CEO or the founders and not the directors or the shareholders as such. The role is quite different. So a director is responsible when they're sitting on the board or for the fiduciary board, they're responsible for managing and making decisions relating to the business. So they actually are involved in decision making. Whereas an advisory board member is more of, acts more of as a sounding board and, and as an advisor and doesn't uh, involve themselves in making decisions that impact the company. Their duties are also very, very different. So a board member is subject to fiduciary and statutory duties, and their statutory duties can be found under legislation, specific legislation in Australia and New Zealand. And if they breach these duties, they can result in personal liability for the director. And we'll go into some of those penalties a little bit later. On the other hand, for advisory directors, they're not regulated by any specific laws. They may be bound by terms of a contract. So if you engage an advisory board member and you have an agreement with them to provide those services, then there might be obligations under those contracts, such as obligations of confidence. The responsibilities are very different as well. 
So a fiduciary board member is responsible to shareholders and to the company as a whole. In some cases, they're also responsible to the shareholder who appoints them. And an advisory board member is only responsible to the person that appointed them. So it's the CEO or the founder, but not to the company as a whole. So in startups, what we often see, and in the case of our friends, Alex and Ben, if they allow Carla or Joel to appoint a director to their board, that director will have the duties of a board director, of a fiduciary director. However, often what you'll see is a provision in the shareholders agreement that will allow their appointee to act also in, in the interests of the shareholder. So where does this leave us? If they appoint that sort of a director, they're called a nominee director, but it's still a fiduciary director. That fiduciary nominee director's sole or primary, I should say, rather than sole, their primary responsibility is still to shareholders and to the company but they are allowed to consider the interests of the shareholder who appointed them if it specifies that in the shareholders agreement or in the constitution. So if an actual conflict of interest arises between a nominee director and the company, then the nominee director really should remove themselves from the position of conflict. So they shouldn't vote on any issues where there's a conflict. Meetings for boards are generally held on a consistent basis. So it's usually quarterly, sometimes it's more. Whereas with advisory board members, there's usually no fixed cadence. And actually they don't often, if ever, meet as a group. So you wouldn't meet as an advisory board group. It's very, very rare. You would usually meet on a one-on-one -on -one basis with the founder or with the CEO as required. And lastly, the the level of commitment and interest is quite different. With board, boards or fiduciary boards, there's a high level of commitment and interest and directors have personal, legal and reputational risks if they don't perform. Whereas on the other hand, advisory board members, there's less risk, particularly if they're not remunerated. It's very ri low risk. So if you wanted to bind someone to commitment to the company, then you'd want them to be on your board. On the other hand, if you don't want to remunerate them, whether it be through funds, through cash or through shares, chances are advisory board seat uh, is a better position for them. But neither of those are determinative and, and we'll go through why. So in the case of our client whose co-founder died, the investor who had a convertible note that had matured and was about to be repaid also had a seat on the board. So my question to you is, can that director, being on a fiduciary board, sit in on board meetings to discuss whether to repay the note or to put the company into administration? Can he vote on that issue? You don't need to answer that question. Just have a think about it and uh, we'll come back to it in the end. By the way, if you have any questions while I'm going through the presentation, feel free to drop it into the chat and uh, I'll answer it as we go or we will have a Q&A session at the end. So why even have a board? Before we decide whether or not to appoint these people to the board, why even have a board? For startups, a board can be a strategic asset. So it allows you, the founder, to think strategically, getting out of the weeds of the day-to-day -day operations of the business. It allows issues to be discussed and challenged. So you can, you can test your ideas with the board. It allows you to share the responsibility of managing the business with other people. You're not going at it alone. And the board ensures that the business is run in a way that is in the interests of the shareholders and other stakeholders. Um, and the interests of stakeholders are considered. So there's a level of accountability when you have a board rather than just running the business and making decisions on your own. Why have an advisory board? It allows you to bounce ideas of people, your advisors, or the people, the directors on the advisory board. A lot of advisory board members provide mentoring for the founder or for the CEO. An advisory board 
seat allows investors to participate in the day-to-day -day issues that arise without making decisions about the things that affect the business. And it allows you to obtain specialist advice about different areas. That's why you'll often see lawyers or accountants being um, advisory board members. And we can go into, we will go into a little bit more detail about what the types of specialist advice you might seek from an advisory board member might be. Now, this is a big question that we get asked all the time. How many directors should I have on my board? Now, for an, a fiduciary board, the size of the board is really related to the complexity and stage of your company. And my advice is always keep your board as lean as possible for as long as possible. So if you're a pre-Series A startup, three directors is more than enough. Okay, so I, I wouldn't have more than three. I'd have three if it was if it was necessary. If you've gone through a cap raise and you had to put another person on the board, but no more than three. After a Series A or a Series B, then you're looking at possibly a five-person board. On the other hand, for an advisory board, given that they're informal and they're not binding, there's no ideal number of individuals to sit on the board as such. What I would say is, if you're paying the advisory board members, then obviously any decision to appoint members means that you need to consider whether or not the company can afford a large size advisory board if you're giving away lots of shares or, or options or, or cash for advisory board members. At the end of the day, it's not the number of people that's important. The number of people is significant for both boards and advisory boards because you don't want a board that's too big. But it's really the composition and the management of the board that's important. And that's what we'll go into in more detail. Who should actually sit on your board? So Akala and Joel, one is an investor who is part of a family office. And the other is Joel, who's really an industry, he was an industry expert. Um, he hadn't had any experience sitting on boards. Should either of these people be allowed on the board. For a board of a startup for startup at the stages of early stage through to scale up, early scale up, we definitely have a founder on the board. If you have a co-founder, then when you first start your startup, then usually both co-founders will be on the board. You should have an independent person on the board, maybe not necessarily initially, if it's just the two co-founders, you don't necessarily need an independent. But if you end up putting an investor on your board, our general rule of thumb is for every investor that you bring onto the board, you should have an independent. And this just gives some balance of views on the board. So you can see if Alex and Ben allow both Carla and Joel to have board seats, all of a sudden, based on our rule, they should be adding two more independents onto their board. So we're up to five or six people already. So it can be very unwieldy. For an advisory board, the size will really depend on the gaps in your knowledge. So what you should do is ask yourself, what are your skills gaps? Where do you need the mentoring and the specialist advice? Where are your weaknesses? And then from there, you can fill in those weaknesses by getting advisory board members who can help you with those specific specialist areas. And as a guide, these are the sorts of areas where the value of the company can be significantly impacted. And so if you have any gaps in your knowledge in technical expertise, so product development specifically, uh, strategy, customer expertise, so someone who could provide you advice on product features and value propositions, someone who has particular expertise in the industry that you work in or that the company that your startup is operating in, and sales, advising on sales tactics and demand creation. And these are just some of the things, some of the areas where uh, real value can be created in your, in your business. So if you have weaknesses in any of these areas, you might want to think about getting an advisory board member to help you fill in those skill gaps. What are the duties of a 
fiduciary board member versus an advisory board member. So I mentioned at the beginning that directors have a number of statutory obligations, which are derived from legislation in Australia and New Zealand. And I also mentioned fiduciary duties. So fiduciary duties entail uh, an obligation owed to a principal, and it's the highest level of obligation. So if you're a director on a fiduciary board with fiduciary obligations, then you need to consider the interests of your principal at all times, being the company, in priority to your own personal interests. That's your fiduciary duties. So the first statutory duty is the duty to exercise your powers and duties with due care and diligence. And this applies in Australia and New Zealand. This means that as a director, the director needs to be attentive and prudent in making board level decisions. So the director needs to act in good faith. The director needs to make investigations, so ask questions, look at documents, talk to people in order to provide an informed basis for their decisions. This means you need to be uh, actively financially informed. So understand the ongoing financial position of the company. It's not enough to be aware of the financial position of the company only at the time that you're required to sign off the accounts, which a lot of directors do. They just look at the accounts once a year and that's it, like our, our uh, co-founder client that I mentioned at the beginning. Exercising your powers and duties with care and diligence also means not allowing the company to trade while it's insolvent. So ensuring that the company is able to pay all debts as and when they become due. And it also means you need to make sure that the company keeps adequate financial records. So if an action for insolvent trading is taken against you as a director and the company has failed to keep adequate financial records, then it can be generally assumed that the company was trading insolvent and you may be exposed to personal liability. So as a director on a fiduciary board, the director should refrain from disclosing confidential information and abusing corporate opportunities. So this means don't disclose information where it could be detrimental to the company's interests. And you should have an understanding of who you can and cannot disclose confidential information to. Fiduciary board members need to exercise their powers and duties in good faith and in the best interest of the company as a whole. So this means acting honestly and fairly in pursuit of the company's best interest as a whole. Directors on a fiduciary board should act for a proper purpose only. So you should not misuse your power for an improper purpose, such as gaining a personal advantage. So don't use your position as a director, the knowledge that you gain as a director, knowledge about the company to benefit yourself or benefit someone else without the authority of the company. And this one we've touched on previously. Directors shouldn't place themselves in situations or become a part of transactions where they are unable to make a decision or their decision is likely to impact the best interests of the company. So what do you do if you do have a conflict of interest? If you have a material personal interest in a matter, it likely means that you have conflict of interest, then you need to disclose it. And that disclosure usually takes place at a director's meeting. Now, sometimes this involves you then not voting on the issue, or sometimes you can, and that will depend on the company's constitution and the shareholders agreement. But if there's any risk arising, so if uh, our, our friend who had was the co-founder whose co-founder died, for example, that investor really should remove himself from a position of voting on the solvency of that company because there's a lot of personal risk in doing that. There are also specific statutory uh, obligations imposed in Australia and New Zealand. Um, the first one in New Zealand is the duty not to trade recklessly. So in New Zealand, what they've done is uh, a lot of the obligations that arose under common law through the cases they've now put into legislation, and th this is one of them. So what this means is uh, a director should not agree to the business of the company being carried out in a way that's likely to create substantial risk of loss to the company's creditors or allow the company to be carried on in a manner that's likely to create substantial risk of serious loss.
A director must not agree to the company incurring an obligation unless the director believes at the time on reasonable grounds that the company will be able to perform the obligation when it's required to do so. There's a duty to supervise the share register, so make sure you have the share register up to date. So the company should be maintaining an interests register where once the director becomes aware that they're interested in a transaction or a proposed transaction with the company, they need to enter into that interest register or have someone write in that interest reg register and note that they have an interest in that issue. Now, if the company has more than one director, then they need to disclose to the board of the company the monetary value of the director's interests. And if they can't be quantified, there's not a monetary value that can be quantified then just an explanation of the nature and the extent of that interest. In Australia, directors need to ensure that the company files and meets its BAS, PAYG and its superannuation liabilities on time. And directors will become personally liable for those amounts if they're more than three months old and the debt hasn't been reported to the ATO. So in the past, you used to be able to put the company into liquidation or administration and absolve your personal liability. But in this case, well, now you no longer can. In addition, if your family members and associates who were partly responsible for the non-compliance, then they too can become personally liable. And this is very significant in Australia. Breaches of the statutory obligation can result in personal liability for directors. You can be at risk of a fine of up to $200,000 where the contravention is serious and materially prejudices the company and its ability to pay its creditors or shareholders. Directors can be personally liable for damages payable for the loss. It could be exposure to criminal charges and fines of up to $370,000 as of today, and imprisonment of up to five years in the case of insolvent trading. And you can be disqualified from managing companies in future. Penalties for breaching your fiduciary obligations in Australia could be, you could receive an order that you pass on any profits to the principal, being generally being the company, and made to pay the company's expenses. Damages or compensation for losses suffered. The director could be ordered to hold money on trust or constructive trust for the company or for their principal. And it could result in rescission or the unwinding of a contract entered into by the director or by the director on behalf of the company. In New Zealand, the duty is to maintain the share register and disclosing interests. If there's been a breach of those obligations, there could be a fine of up to $5,000. These are New Zealand dollars. It's a fine of up to $200,000 for a serious breach of a duty to act in good faith in the best interests of the company. Could be imprisonment. And you can be disqualified as well. So really, there are a lot of very serious consequences if, one, you don't understand your duties, and two, you breach them. What are the consequences of advisory board members? Well, we know that advisory board members don't have any fiduciary duties and they don't have any statutory duties. So there aren't any penalties written into the legislation. But there are possibly contractual duties. So there's a, an agreement called a FAST, F-A-S-T, a Founder Advisory Standard Template Agreement that we've seen some clients use to engage advisory board members. So there might be obligations under that, or if your advisory board member is engaged through an independent contractor agreement, there might be duties under that. And so any consequences of breach will generally be uh, exposure to litigation for a breach of contract. So as you can see, being on a board, a fiduciary board versus being on a 
uh, an advisory board exposes a lot difference, a lot of difference in terms of risk. And people get really excited about being on a uh, board of directors, but uh, it's not necessarily a great thing to be on a board of directors. So what do we do when directors go rogue? What do we mean by when directors go rogue? Now, there's a vast shopping list of ways that directors can behave badly. So, for example, they can pursue their own personal agenda. They can pursue the agenda of a third party. Um, if anyone has other examples of where they've come across directors behaving badly, drop it into the chat. I'd love to hear about it. But other examples are regularly missing meetings, not respecting the confidentiality of the company um, or information shared with the board, failing to complete tasks or work that's assigned to them, failing to disclose conflicts of interest, um, refusing to assist with work, disrespectful behaviour to other board members. All of these things can constitute bad behaviour. Our advice to clients generally, though, with bad behaviour is before jumping to conclusions, look at the behaviour and work out whether or not it actually is bad behaviour. So we had a situation with one startup where one of the investor appointed directors was talking to management directly about issues. Now, the director wasn't an executive director, so wasn't involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the business. So we counseled the founder to have the chair speak to the director to determine whether the director was developing back channels with line managers to undermine the CEO, or perhaps they were simply seeking to clarify information from people impacted by their decisions. So was, was the director trying to create political factions or were they really just getting a consensus for a shared opinion? So really look into it before jumping to conclusions. Ultimately though, bad behavior rears its head in different ways and it adversely affects the board's productivity and decision-making and it can cost your startup time and money. I would say 80% of startups that we come across die because of bad boards or boards that behave badly. But be careful because just because someone is dissenting, it doesn't mean that they're acting rogue. They may be just trying to make a positive contribution by being the devil's advocate, so to speak. So how do we prevent or prepare for bad behavior? Having a director's manual. Now, this is a question directed to you in the audience. How many of you actually in your startup have set written down expectations and requirements for your board members particularly if you're you have more than one director and particularly where one of those directors is not also a co-founder do you have written down anywhere a manual that says this is what directors should and shouldn't do most startups don't so have it written down Create a culture of inclusion and openness. So allow people to put issues on the table for discussion. Should have an effective chair. So someone who stays focused on the issues, someone who runs the meetings on time. And finally, document everything. So every discussion with board members that relates to business should be noted down in director's minutes. And that way, if anything goes to court, you'll have a strong set of evidence to demonstrate your case. So once the bad behavior is identified, there are a few ways to troubleshoot it. A very simple way and non-aggressive way is to go through the director's manual that you now have with the entire board, not with just that one member, but with the entire board so that everyone's on the same page about expectations. The second is you can delegate certain decision-making authority to a committee. So in the case of our client where the investor had a conflict of interest because of the convertible note becoming payable, what the client decided to do was set up a separate committee to run capital raising. And so that investor who also had some leverage over putting more money into the business wasn't involved in the decision making relating to the cap raise. We're all human beings, have a private conversation with the director and, and call out that bad behavior. And this really is the responsibility of the chair. If you have a chair that's not the CEO, the chair should have this conversation. And if all things can't be resolved, 
then you'd need to look at removing that director. And to work out how you remove a director, look at the company's constitution and the shareholders agreement, if you have one. How do we actually negotiate? How will Alex and Ben negotiate the board seat? So in our masterclass, we teach negotiation skills. And the first thing we always say is work together to find an agreement that works for all sides. So it's not about one person or one party winning. Don't bargain over positions. And focus on interests and not positions. So a position is something that you've decided on, whereas interests are what caused you to make that decision. So an example of what this might look like is Joel might say to Alex and Ben, I've got lots of expertise in this area and I'm coming into the business early, so I want a board seat. And Alex, Alex's response from a position is, we're still pre-revenue, we don't want anyone other than founders on the board. And Joel's response may well be, well, if that's the case, I don't want to put in any money this early. I'd really love to work with you, I'd love what you're doing, but there's no way that we can work together unless I have a board seat. So you can see that they're stuck in a battle of wills. This is my position, this is my position, and we're not going to negotiate. So if you'd rather focus on interests instead, the conversation might go like this. Joel will say, I've got lots of expertise in this area. I want to have visibility over the board, what the board is doing, because I think I can provide really valuable input. This is the reason why I want a board seat. Alex, on the other hand, would say, look, we'd love to have your input. I'd love to be able to come to you and bounce ideas and get your input about industry-specific issues since you have lots of industry expertise. We want to ensure the board is agile and can make decisions quickly, and we don't want to get stuck in paperwork. So that's the reasoning behind each of their positions. So the problem becomes, how do you enable Joel to have visibility of board decisions and provide input about industry-related issues that he thinks he has expertise in, while ensuring the board doesn't become too unwieldy with too many people? And so that becomes a problem that is resolvable. And the way we resolved it was that they ultimately appointed their friend Joel to the advisory board. Uh, we talked about the pros and cons of being a board director and the potential liability, personal liability that could be that could become Joel's liability. And he realized that he didn't actually really want to be exposed in that way. So we appointed him to the advisory board and we allowed Carla to appoint one nominee to the board. And after that, because they appointed Carla, Ben stepped down from the board. So only Alex, the single founder, was on the board and they also appointed an independent. So they had a board of three. So that completes the main part of the presentation today. Now I've got a quick quiz for you, as I promised, and Tony's going to post it up onto our Facebook page. And that is, when can a fiduciary director be personally liable for the liabilities of the startup? When can a fiduciary director be personally liable for the liabilities of the startup? And this can be in Australia or New Zealand. So Tony's posted a link to Facebook in the chat. If you click on that and put your answer there, the winner will win a ticket to our masterclass. This is a ticket without the term sheet included. So this is valued at $599. Might give you a couple of minutes to do that. Tony, you can let me know when there are sufficient uh, responses on the Facebook page, and then I'll pick a number. I'm going to pick the first one off the rank. Who was that and what was the answer? Yep. Uh, so that was Belinda Jane Buckley. Um, her response is BAS wages and superannuation. Yes. Bingo. That's in Australia. Absolutely. So if it's more than three months overdue and you haven't reported it, you can be personally liable as a director. Well done, Belinda. We'll uh, get in touch with you after this to tell you about uh, your free ticket to the masterclass. So I've mentioned this before, our term sheet negotiation masterclass is on Monday, the 21st of November. It's a half day online course where we teach you the main issues that arise in a capital raising negotiation. You learn how to navigate your way around a term sheet. You learn all the lingo and how to negotiate it. And then you walk away with an investor ready term sheet. It's a very hands-on and we do lots of negotiation exercises. Uh, if you have your own term sheet, you can bring that along and we'll teach you how to negotiate it. 
Now, for attendees of this webinar only, we have a special offer for the next 24 hours only. Use these codes to get essentially an 80% discount on the ticket. So board to get a 99% $99 ticket or board TS to get a $599 ticket and it includes a term sheet. The term sheet itself is actually valued at $1,200. You're welcome, Belinda. It's available for the next 24 hours only. Please do connect with me through our website, through our Facebook page or Instagram. We have a really interesting podcast called The Raise where we talk to founders who have been on the capital raising journey. Lots of gold nuggets in there. I highly recommend it, although I am very biased. And uh, if you're on TikTok, follow me on TikTok. That's a lot of fun as well. Any questions before we go today? How do you go negotiate advisor fees? Oh, that's a good one. So again, interests. You know, what, what's the interest of the advisor? You know, why do they want to get paid will be the main question. And, you know, the thing is, most advisors will say to you, I'm not doing this for money, right? So when they say that, that's great. So why, why do they want to get paid? So most advisory board members will say, I'm not doing this for money. You know, this is not my main gig. Even if you pay me a hundred thousand dollars, it's really not even 5% of my salary. So the starting point, Joseph, is to ask them, why, why do you want to get paid? What's the reason for wanting to get paid? Because from the startup's position, obviously you want to value their time, but you want to minimize your expenditure. And so if they come back and say to you, we just want to make sure that you turn up. We just want to make sure that we're not wasting our time uh, and you're not getting any value then the way you would negotiate is that that is, okay, well, in that case, how do we ensure that there's a commitment for us to turn up to meetings? And there are lots of different ways that you can do that without having to pay them a fee. So just go, go back to the position and get them to tell you. The other negotiating tip I'll give you is embrace the silence. So ask them a question and let, let them answer it. So ask them why, why do you want to get paid this fee? Does that help, Joseph? You're welcome. A question from Apirisham. Is ESOP a way to the advisory board? Do you mean um, can you issue ESOPs as, as remuneration? Is that what you mean? Yes. So definitely, yes, um, advisors do or can be remunerated by being issued um, shares or options that come from the ESOP pool, definitely. So this is where the size of the advisory board is important is you don't want to end up, say you've only got 10% to allocate to ESOP and, you know, you could have five advisors on your advisory board. You don't want to be in a position where you give away 5% of the company, which is half of the ESOP pool to advisors. So yes, it is, but uh, have a think about how much that advisor is actually worth. Also frame it in the, in terms of KPIs Make sure that you're not giving away shares or options to advisors who don't perform. And I've seen many, many cases of advisors taking their one or 2% and then disappearing. That happens all the time. So if you're going to give it away or allocate some ESOP to them, make sure there are KPIs and a good cliff to make sure that they stick around and do what they say they can do because it, it's a bit of a minefield and they can promise the world and deliver very little. Anyone else have questions? Still got a few people sticking around. You're welcome. International directors, how do, how do we discuss bringing them on board? Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't change your negotiations, Joseph. Uh, Australian and New Zealand companies need to have at least one resident director. So, so long as you have one Australian resident director, um, I know you're based in Australia, then uh, you the discussion around bringing on international directors is the same. Was there anything specific about international directors that you wanted to ask? Their obligations are exactly the same. Their duties are exactly the same. Joseph's asked, pricing in AUD versus USD, do you mean the, the fee for the directors? Whether you price them? Yeah. Uh, this is completely flexible depending on the negotiations that you have. Um, if you're an Australian company, I, usually I would always recommend uh, talking in um, AUD terms or allowing yourself to pay in AUD terms. And the reason why is that you don't take the 
exchange risk. Um, you can, of course, negotiate, say, we'll pay you, you know, 50,000 USD, which then translates to, you know, 100,000 AUD, but have that Australian dollar amount specifically written into the contract so that you're not bearing the uh, foreign exchange risk. Is there a jurisdiction that goes on their contract bylaws or company acts, etc.? cetera? Is there a jurisdiction that goes on their contract bylaws? So I'm trying to understand the question. <laughs> when you draw up contracts on, oh, right. Okay. So um, which, which law governs the contract if you're engaging international directors? Is that what you mean? Okay, great. <laughs> so this is a this is a bigger legal uh, legal question, which is which which should be the law that governs the contract when you're engaging international directors. Usually, the correct or the best jurisdiction to select is the jurisdiction where the party that is possibly liable uh, has most of their assets. So that's the commercial answer, not necessarily the legal answer. Um, in the case of engaging directors, I would say that you should select the jurisdiction of the company. Uh, and the reason why I say that is if there was to be any uh, any issues between the company and the director and there was litigation, then you'd want to be able to sue them in the jurisdiction that is most suitable to you. And so you choose the jurisdiction of the company. Thanks, Belinda. You're welcome. We'll be in touch. Some great questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. That's us for today. You have a great week too. Thank you for joining us today. Bye everyone. Bye.